ourselves with other believers and spend some time in your word, Lord. I pray, Father God, that this morning that you would challenge us, that you would inspire us, and that you would bring us into a renewed sense of understanding of your word and your purpose and your hope for us, Lord, as we seek to hear your heartbeat, Lord, to hear the thing that is central to your, to your relationship with us, Father. I ask that, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much to those who all prayed for me and uh, held me up in your prayers. I'm much better. Thank you very, very much. Um, this morning, I wanted to carry on with, with where I'd started. We spoke on, on Pentecost Sunday. We spoke about the... Um, Briefly, we spoke about the seven weeks of festivals that lead up, that start at, um, that start at uh, Passover and eventually end up in, in Pentecost, what the Jewish people call Savo'ot, which means the festival of sevens. So there's seven weeks of, of seven, and then on the, on the last of those 49 days, on the 50th day, they celebrate the actual festival by eating bread that has both yeast and eggs in it. And um, it is quite an amazing um, spiritual connotation there of talking about life and sharing and bringing and, and that there's always two loaves of bread, so one for yourself and one to give to somebody. Um, as That's brought as an offering <clears throat> before the Lord. And that we call it Pentecost because of the Greek and the New Testament, the word penta meaning five and 50 days being then the, basically the celebration of 50 days after Passover. <coughs> So, <coughs> we start again with this nonsense. So, God's heart has always been and, and has from the beginning of time is to reunite us with him in relationship. <coughs> I don't know where Belinda is. Can you maybe? Oh, there she comes. I'm going to get a glass of water. My love, can you get me a glass of water, please? <coughs> Sorry. So the festival celebrates the, the Pentecost, but the Pentecost pi picture is much bigger than simply the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In fact, like I shared briefly, the word there for, for tongues is different to the Greek word used for tongues when Paul makes reference to angelic languages or tongues perhaps as we would understand it in, in our context. The tongues in that context was that there was Jews from all over the world and suddenly everyone was telling them about the gospel but in their own language, in their own dialect so that this could go out into the world. But you know, as human beings are and as we are, we get distracted, right? We get caught up in, in, in remembering and, and holding on to and preserving and, and keeping. <coughs> Goodness me. We get, we, get <clears throat> we get caught up in holding on to and hanging on to and remaining in our, our pattern and our lifestyle. And it's not a unique situation. In fact, it, it's, quite a, <laughs> it's quite a common situation. It's quite a common situation. And um, the, the, the interesting part of this common situation is that we... As people, we like to be comfortable, am I right? We like things the way we like things. What you had for breakfast this morning, have you had that for breakfast in some degree of regularity over the last, I don't know, five years? Some of us, 25 years? We, we, we like the familiarity of consistency, don't we? Am I right? We like things the way we like things, and we prefer things to be the way they always were. And I can only imagine how this would have affected the Jewish people because of the importance of the regularity of their festivals and the, and the feasts. That they got so focused on those things that there was no way that they could get disrupted. Nothing could interfere. It had to be the same all the time. And as they say in the classics, sometimes we can't see the forest for the trees, right? We get so stuck in... Uh, 
<clears throat> in a cycle that we get distracted from what's really happening. Or the opposite thing happens, which the enemy loves to do to us. He makes us busy with things that aren't of value. He keeps us caught up in patterns and cycles that, that we're constantly focusing on what's going to happen next. Has this sign come through? Has this thing happened? <coughs> Excuse me. Are we living in the end times? And the short answer is yes. But to steal the line from a good friend of mine, well, uh, uh, an acquaintance of mine, sometimes a statement or an answer will take a week to share properly. It's not, you can't just make one blind statement and say, well, that's it and that's how it is. There's some statements that require learning and, and, and depth, like discussing who is God. It's not simply he is my father. There's much, much more to it than that. And that infers a bit of discipleship and a bit of growing and a bit of continued conversation to understand more of the nuances involved. Now what's happened to date is that the Hebrew nation have been taught and taught and shown and taught and shown through all the festivals and through all the confirmations of the prophets and all the realities. And I want us to look at those <coughs> This morning, I'm, I'm going to start in the book of Acts, and um, we're going to read quite a bit of scripture this morning, and then we'll, we'll go into deeper into that. So Acts chapter 3, we're going to read from 1 to 36, we're going to go through it steadily together. So Peter went that afternoon to, to the temple to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. <clears throat> Remember, there's a pattern, there's a, there's a history there's certain times of the day when they would meet together in certain places. And as they approached the te a temple, a lame man from birth, who had been carried each day to be put beside the temple gate, which was called the beautiful gate, so he could beg for people who were going to the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. It's so beautiful because if they, what he asked them for was alms, the currency of the time, and what Jesus did is gave him legs. Isn't that incredible? We don't always get what we want, but we always get what we need. Amen? Tell your neighbor, I don't always get what I want, but I always get what I need. <clears throat> we don't always get what we want, but we always get what we need. Eh? Peter and John looked at him intently. They paid attention to the man. They took time to notice him. They saw him. And then Peter said, look at us. And the man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money, but Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Can you imagine that moment when this man's life literally turns 180 degrees? He'd come with the expectation of, of survival, and God gave him thrival. It's a real word. Hey? He came with an expectation of just, just enough to cope. And he got given the ability to do more for himself through Christ. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankle were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet and began to walk. Then walking, leaping and praising God. Then they, and he went to the temple with them. And that's so interesting because I had a, we were having a discussion on our family chat group recently about why did Jesus do this and why did Jesus do this. And you notice that prior to Pentecost, Jesus constantly defers the person who is healed to go to the temple and go and present yourself to the priests. He says, don't tell anyone about this. Just... In fact, the only person that I can deduce, and I could, be, I could be off the mark here, but the man from God, or the man who he casts the demons out of, that goes into the pigs, he says to the man, go and tell what God has done for you. He doesn't even say it's what I have done for you. He says, go and tell what God has done for you. It's like the Lord is constantly referring and saying, listen, this is the Father's heart. This is His heartbeat. Wholeness. Purity, love, truth, healing, a future, a hope. 
And then verse 9, it says, When all the people saw him work, walking and heard him praising God. So all the people saw him. But I don't know that they recognized him because it seems that only a verse later they realized who he is. So they noticed this guy. He's jumping around. He's excited. The Lord's done something palpable and tangible in his life and he's celebrating it and he's kind of worshiping the Lord, right? Remember we spoke about every act is an act, everything we do is an act of worship. But when they realized he was the lame beggar who had often seen at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. Now think about this absolutely astounded statement. And it's kind of, I was going, but now Jesus has been on the scene and in the temple and around Jerusalem, and the whole town has been buzzing with what's happening and what happened to him. At the crucifixion, we know that there was an earthquake and that, and that tombs erupted and that their dead had been resurrected and they walked among people and people knew them. So you kind of go, but come on, guys, have you not seen it yet? It kind of left me going, wow, how easily do we get distracted? How easily do we forget how miraculous God is and how much miracle he's performed in your life through your life and around you constantly, daily, so much so that we don't see it anymore. In one sense, it's kind of, wow, what a blessing. We live in a supernatural world and, and we accept that as a reality. Great. But on the other side, I'm going, shouldn't we have noticed? Shouldn't we have taken this moment and said, thank you, Lord, instead of being caught up in the next thing? How many times do we, are we given an incredible blessing and we go, thanks, but what I'd really like is one of those. What I really need is another. We, we, don't, we don't seem to, am I the only one? We don't seem to take that moment to, to go, oh, thank you. Thank you. Celebrate. The little things. I mean, this man is celebrating the fact that he can walk and he'd never been able to. What an incredible gift. And they were absolutely astounded. I love that translation. And they all rushed out in amazement into Solomon's colonnade. So the big area around the outside of the, of, the, of the temple. Where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. So I can only imagine this guy saying, listen, these are the guys that you want to pray for you. Because <laughs> when they pray, things happen. So nothing's changed about humanity, right? We all flock to someone who's done something amazing. Hey. And Peter saw this opportunity and he addressed the crowd. You see Peter's heart, eh? I understand how it is to not have, and we have, so have some with me. Isn't that true? This heart to share, this heart to involve and encourage and draw in. People of Israel, he says. Now he's speaking to the Jews because they're in the Jewish temple. What is surprising about this? And you stare at us as though we are made, as though we made this man walk in our own power or godliness. I don't know about your Bible, but mine's got that in lowercase. Yeah. So he's, he's kind of going, hang on a second, guys. You guys are wanting to give credit to the wrong person here. For it is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. And this same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him, you rejected the holy and righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. And you killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead and we are the witnesses to that fact. So he, I sometimes think to myself, Peter starts well and he goes, why are you so amazed? We serve a supernatural God, a star-breathing God. Who, who designed us perfectly, who made everything on this planet work together in absolute immaculate perfection. Why are you so astounded? You know this God. We've been learning about him 
for 500 generations kind of thing. We, what, what, is, what is it that's got you so blown away, guys? And then he chimes in and he says, yeah, but you know, you guys, you guys killed the Christ, eh? And I wonder whether it's the Holy Spirit leading or whether it's Peter, the, the sandal eater, who's, who's charged into the midst and going, hey, you guys need to get this sorted out. But then verse, I'm just going to read verse 17. It says, friends. In the Greek it says, brothers. I realize that you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. So we know now that Peter wasn't just being the guy who charges into the middle of the fight and starts handing out hidings and then realizes that there wasn't a problem. He's really been discerning of the Holy Spirit. It was done in ignorance. But God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Now repent of your sins. Turn around. Go in a new direction. Repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he again will send you Jesus, our appointed Messiah. I want to pause there for a moment. I base my personal eschatology, my end time study, my understanding of, 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 the, of the day of the final trumpet will sound, in large part on this, and on the chapter from Hebrews that I want to share. And the thing that I want to touch on is that many of us, and I include colleagues and friends and peers, many of us, get so caught up in trying to define the date and whether it will be a tribulation first and then it will be taken up and then is there a rapture or isn't there a rapture or is there this or is there that? Or has this, or is this war a sign, or is this earthquake a sign? The answer is yes to all of it. But here's what's important. The day that there's peace in Israel, real peace, not synthetic peace, true peace, because, I mean, this is what it tells us. Realize, um, verse, verse 19, um, Oh, sorry, verse, verse 18. God was fulfilling what the prophets foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Confirmation that the Messiah had to be, um, that Jesus had to be crucified. It was God's purpose that it happened. He was the sacrifice. He was the Passover lamb. Then it says, now repent from your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Up until right now, Jewish people do not believe they can be absolved of sin. They make an offering that covers the sin. But the problem is that since Christ happened, they have not been able to do it because the temple has been closed. Seventy years after the temple was destroyed, and the only place that the Jewish people feel that they can make a physical sacrifice of blood and thereby absolve sin is in that temple. Now, and altars have been made, and everyone's watched the hundreds of YouTube videos. Yes. But they haven't been able to actually make the sacrifice. Christ has is, is proven. It's like God's closed the door to say, hey, look, look. I'm, I'm not Jesus, the, 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 Jewish, the, the Catholic God. Because I've had a couple of Jewish folks say, no, he's a Catholic guy. He's, not, he's got nothing to do with us Jews. And then later discover that he was a Jewish man. And, and it's just transformed their life. Anyway, verse, 10, uh, verse 20. And then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he will again send you Jesus, the appointed Messiah. So my understanding is very limited. I'll be first to admit it. But I know this. A trumpet will sound. Everyone will hear it. And everyone will know it. And that's when the Lord will come. But I say this too. Be ready. We are told, have your bags packed. Be ready. The concept of the Passover was to have a jacket and a staff to eat hastily as one disturbed to, to go quickly. 
Don't wait and see and, and, and tarry. Be ready to go. Be ready at all times, in season and out. But you know what happens is the enemy likes to keep us busy. He likes to keep us busy with all kinds of things. He pumps us with conspiracy theories. I call them propaganda. Propaganda is the most effective tool in war. They say that propaganda and landmines is what wins wars. Because it creates confusion and it seeds hopelessness. Ah, oh, this is wrong. This is a failure. There's been so many scenarios where over the last 35 years I did a few researches of, of, of religious groups, Christian groups, who've said this year and this time the Lord is coming and they've literally gone to ground and, and said, right, that's it, we are waiting for the Messiah and that date has come and that date has passed. Jesus said, only the Father knows the time and the hour. But be ready. By no means am I saying don't. Be ready in season and out. Study, learn, grow, discern. But only God knows the, day, the time and the date. In fact, the only God knows the time and the date that He will call on us. That moment when we will enter eternity and have to stand before Him and say, Here I am. Where would you have me go? What would you have me do? So I want to get to the next piece of Scripture this morning. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 to 13. I love this book. It's, it's kind of one of those that really, I go back to it a lot. A good friend of mine from college says, he used to always say, Hebrews, it's awesome, but it's hard. It's a very intense book. Lots of, lots of discussion around who wrote it and who may have written it and who could have. The fact of the matter is, we don't know. There's some literary arguments and there's some, and there's some practical arguments, but the, the interesting part was I always felt like I, I'm sure that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and I was pretty adamant about the fact. And at the end of my year of biblical studies, I was like, okay, we don't know who wrote the book. It's accounted to many. It's, it's inferred to be uh, some or, or part of many. Um, if, you, if you read... Um, Hebrews uh, chapter 1, you see that this person knows somebody. He, he refers to him by name and goes, but my brother, you know. And of course we base that on that, but like all the other letters in the scripture, the person signed it. You know, we know that John wrote the book of Revelation. We know Luke wrote the book of Acts. We, we know this because they signed their letters. It's one of those that isn't. And it's such a powerful book and it speaks so assertively. And I want to touch specific, specifically this morning on Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 to, 30, 1 to 13. And this is something that for me is so true because when we are distracted, we are often not at peace. Amen? When, when we are distracted and uncertain or bewildered by something or there's a little bit of turmoil, we, we're not at peace. Now, everywhere we read, God is a God of peace. In fact, the gifts of the Spirit are hope, love, peace, gentleness, kindness, mercy, long-suffering. It's, it's all those things over and over and over. And I always had this benchmark. When we ask the Lord, Lord, must we do this? Then we wait for the peace. And if there isn't peace, we don't do it. Because maybe it's a good idea, but perhaps it's not a God idea. So the Lord, the Lord shares, I believe, from his heart to ours in, in Hebrews chapter 4, God's promise of entering rest. It's about the most wonderful part about this particular piece of scripture. When you go and look at the Greek, the word is rest. <laughs> it's one of those where there's, no, where there's no inference. The English language gave us exactly the right thing. The, the promise of, of entering into his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear or respect that some of you might fail to experience it. That's a concern, that some of us will not experience that rest. For it is the good news that God prepared this rest has been announced to all of us 
just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith with those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter into his rest. As for others, God said, in my anger I took an oath that they will never enter into my place of rest. It's an interesting thought that. What is this place of rest? I think we call it heaven or paradise. But let's keep going and find out where this place of rest is. Even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. So in other words, what we need to do is to go to Genesis chapter 1 to go and figure out what happened when he made the world. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. It's an interesting thought that. We know it is ready because of the place in the scriptures where it mentions on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. So now there's an interesting inference because is he talking about heaven or are they talking about a Sabbath day, a day of rest? But others, other passage, God says, they will never enter into my place of rest. So God's rest is there for people to enter into. But those who first heard this good news failed to enter into this rest because they disobeyed God. So now it's a bit confusing. Who is he talking to? The Hebrews? The Jewish people, in other words? Or to everybody? So let's continue in verse 7. So God set, to set another time for entering into his rest. So there's grace. The Lord made a space. And he said, okay, it didn't work this time. Let's try again. Let's see if we can bring them in a second time. And that time is today. Hallelujah. And God announced this through David and much later in the words that he quoted. Today when I hear this voice, do not harden your hearts. So if Joshua had succeeded in giving them rest, then God would have spoken about another day that is still to come. So now we see they are definitely still talking. He's talking to the Jewish people or to the Hebrew nation. So this special rest still wait, is still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter into that rest. So this rest is available, but we need to enter into it. We need to partake in it. We need to become a part of it. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. For the word of the God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. And it continues on. If you want to continue to read there, it speaks about the high priest, Jesus, who enters heaven and, and seeks. The Lord seeks one thing with us, from us, all the time. It's relationship. Because when we're in a relationship with him, we feel restful, we feel peaceful, we feel calm. There's no fear, there's certainty. So if something is driving you that's fearful, nerve-wracking, uncertain, or concerning, give it to God. Sometimes, the Lord, sometimes in Scripture we hear that the Lord does not tempt. He helps us to grow, but he doesn't set us up to fail. 
That's the enemy's job. The enemy's job is to set uncertainty, to sprout propaganda, to set people against one another and to seed confusion constantly. What's the important thing? Be right with the Lord. Because when you are, you'll be at peace. And when you have the peace of the Lord that surpasses all human understanding, you can only succeed. Whether the trumpet sounds or whether one, the person next to you disappears out of their car, whichever of the two happens, whether there's a tribulation first and then a, re a taking away or whether there's a taking away followed by a tribulation, what will happen, God will allow to do. What we need to do is enter into his rest. Trust him. Stand with and alongside and, and let him be him. And we need to just be obedient and peaceful and calm and still. I hope this challenges you as it has me. And um, I pray that the Lord uses his word to bless you and, um, and bring you peace. I just want to say a prayer with us as we close this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that before the dawn of time, you set a place aside for us. And when we didn't make the mark, you set another place aside for us. And when we didn't make the mark, you set another place aside for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that your heart is to restore us into a relationship with you. We pray, Father God, that you would use us as instruments to share this truth with others to do like Peter and John did and say, this I don't have, but this that I do, I will share with you. That they would walk alongside, Lord, that we would gaze, gather together, Father, that we would be useful instruments in your kingdom, Father God. That, Lord, that at that moment of your choosing, when you make that final call, that we would be found acceptable to you, Father, and enter into your final stage of rest, but we thank you, Lord, for the rest and the peace that you give us now by your Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, that you would dwell with us and among us. Work through us and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, if you want to